Hey girls, it's Friday. I am here. I'm ready to go. I am going to be outlining a topic that you guys submitted this week. Um, let me make sure this is live streaming before I keep going. Okay, we got it. We got it. We're going. And if you are joining me and want to do this in real time with me, you either need a piece of paper or a Bible that has some space in it, a journaling Bible. And I just use one highlighter and one pen. So today we're going to be talking about Hebrews. So we're going to do Hebrews. Uh, one was submitted by Annette McDonald Messer. And then also Katrina Nucarado, I hope I'm saying that right, asked for me to do Hebrews 7 and 8. So I'm going to try to tackle Hebrews 1, 7, and 8. So if you'll flip over to Hebrews. And I feel like I still sing the song I learned in elementary school. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> All these years later. So we're doing Hebrews 1. And I'm going to scoot this so you can see a little closer. And, okay. Okay, so I'm going to outline Hebrews 1, chapter 1, and uh, you can do it along with me or you can um, just watch. So um, I'm not going to read every single word, but I'm going to kind of show you my way of outlining these. And if we just start at the beginning, it talks about God's final word is his son. Um, the book of Hebrews, just for a little background, is in the context of what's happening in the Bible the book of Hebrews is after Jesus has gone to heaven, he's been resurrected, and this is kind of the new church era. So that's where we are in the timeline of uh, Christians are a new thing, and so we're learning from uh, the founding fathers of Christianity. And Hebrews, they're not exactly sure who wrote it. It might have been Barnabas, um, but it's one of those that is not written by Paul. It's a letter to a church that is, we don't know who that's from exactly. So let me just go through and start highlighting stuff to figure out what in the world this is talking about. It says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. So I'm going to highlight that God spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so he's spoken through through his prophets and through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. Okay, so now we're talking about his son, which is Jesus, and now it's listing off things that Jesus is or has done. So he's appointed heir of all things. He, through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he sits next to God in heaven. And he became as much superior to the angels, superior to the angels, as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So basically what I'm going through is highlighting all the, th all the descriptions of his son that he's speaking to us through. So over here, I'm going to just make, you can write his son... Uh, you can write Jesus. I'm going to write Jesus. And I'm just going to make a list of those things that I just said. So we've got, and I use the NIV. I'm not like against other versions. That's just what I grew up on. So that's what I'm referencing. So your version might word these a little bit different, but these are how my, vers my version words it. So heir of all things. The universe was made through him, but I'm just going to write made universe. 
radiance of God's glory. He's the exact representation of God's being. So you can word these however you want to paraphrase them. Um, sustains all things by his word. Sustains all things. He provides purification for sin. Purifies us from sin. So I'm just paraphrasing. You can write exact phrases if you want. Uh, sits at right hand of God. And then it said he's superior to angels. So when I take notes, I'm not here to be like, let's debate this. I'm literally looking at this like a textbook that I would study for a test. So what I'm doing is highlighting the main points and I'm organizing them. And the reason I do this is so that I can um, understand the concepts better. I can memorize things. I can um, start to just understand the teaching of it because literally the Bible is teaching us. The word teach is everywhere. So I'm going to study it or and teach it like a teacher would. And then I don't want you to stop there. This is a tool for you to be able to apply it. So I'm always teaching biblical literacy, which is basically a fancy way to say understanding what the Bible says. Um, understanding the story of it as if it were a novel, like the timeline of everything and how it fits together. And then my other thing I teach is spiritual growth. So the point of us doing this is so we get stronger in our biblical literacy so that we can grow spiritually and apply it to our lives. Um, some of us are really intimidated by opening the Bible because we don't know how to study it. And um, a lot of us were taught just apply it, but if we don't know how to study it, then how do we know how to apply it? So that's why I like to um, start here and then it's kind of a um, launching pad for, okay, now what does it mean? How can we apply it? So right here, what I want to talk, what I want to show you is then it talks about the sun superior to angels and it's got a bunch of quotes. And usually when they're quoting stuff like this, it's referencing the Old Testament Um and that usually is a prophecy that is being fulfilled. And if you want to know where these quotes come from, if you look really close, there's a little footnote. Like this one says, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And it's got a tiny A. So just like any book, you'll look down at the bottom. And it says right here at the A, Psalm 2-7. So right here, I know that this is being quoted. It's not the first time it's been said. And it was said in Psalm 2-7. Now, not all the Psalms were written by David, but most of the Psalms were written by David. So um, I'm assuming that this is pro most likely a Psalm written by David. But I encourage you to go back and read it and figure out what the context of that was. And then it might give you some insight into what this means and why it was quoted here. But all of these are basically prophecies that are being fulfilled through Jesus's coming that were predicted in the Old Testament. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and highlight all of these quotations and write their little footnote reference next to it. And then when you come back to here or when the video is over, if you wanna look into that for further Bible study, to look at those references, then you can. So you should have these at the bottom of every Bible. This is pretty typical that even if you don't have like a big reference section in the back of your Bible, you'll have the little footnotes at the bottom. So I'm not gonna go back and forth. I'm just gonna write them and you can copy them if you want. So this one, I will be his father and he will be my son is referencing 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 1 Chronicles 17, 13. So this one, when you look into it, it might be this line goes with this and this line goes with this, or it might be that it's been quoted twice. Um, so it's good to know the context of that stuff. Let all the angels worship him is from Deuteronomy 32, 42. He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire is Psalm 104.4, four. 
I'm just checking them these off at the bottom. And then your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And that whole section has one footnote that is, this is found in Psalm 45, 6 through 7. And then this section... In the beginning, Lord, you lay the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. And that is footnote F, which is Psalm 102, 25 through 27. And then there's one more quotation. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110, one. Okay, and so one thing I do wanna point out um, is that these are all Old Testament prophecies that are being fulfilled. You know I got a doodle on here. Okay, and then I loved this little verse right here that was, where was it? You remain the same, your years will never end. So I'm going to just kind of pull that out because I want to maybe memorize it or just have that reminder when I flip to these pages. So I'm just going to make this part look pretty. So there's really no rules on how to do this. It's just kind of whatever speaks to you in the moment. And I'm going to write one verses 12 right there. And then um, just to add some little doodles, I'm going to do these little speech bubbles to show that this is a quote. You don't have to do all that, but I like to do that. Okay, so that's what my page looks like. That is all I'm gonna get into in Hebrews 1. There's a whole lot more you can unpack in here. Um, start by looking at, at all these verses or reading the entire book of Hebrews. Um, yeah, there's so much you can look into, but I'm going to try to get more than one person's request today. So we're going to flip over to Hebrews 7, chapter 7. And that's right here. And actually, I'm so happy that this is fitting on one page because it wasn't last week. Okay, let me flip over. Okay, this part, there's a lot that's happened between Hebrews 1 and Hebrews 7, but let's just, um, that's why I encourage you to read the whole book so you don't take things out of context. But for the sake of this um, exercise, we're just going to dig right into chapter 7 and try to figure out what it means um, with the notes that we're going to take. So this section is about Melchizedek. The I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but that's what I think, <laughs> the priest. And then this section is that Jesus is like Melchizedek. So that's what this section is about, our pre, uh, the concept of priests. And so the Old um, Testament, you always had to have a priest to give sacrifices, um, to help the people forget, be forgiven of their sins. And then when Jesus came, he got rid of the Old Covenant and was the perfect sacrifice dying on the cross. And so they're saying that this is the new covenant is that we don't have to continually give these sacrifices. Jesus offered himself as the perfect sacrifice. So um, I can already tell that's what this is going to be about is old covenant versus new covenant, just because I have researched the Bible and I understand the priesthoods um, basics. <laughs> so let's take some notes on who this guy is in the Margin. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, priest of God Most High, 
he met Abraham. So it's already given me a timeline. He was around when Abraham was around. So very beginning, Genesis, book of Genesis. Returning from the defeat of the kings and he blessed him. So I'm just kind of doing again like I did on the other page. What are the little things that this character did? Um, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. It also means king of Salem and king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So I'm not exactly sure what that sentence means, but um, I do not really remember a lot about him in the Old Testament, which I need to, which is another way I study the Bible is I don't really remember this guy very well. It doesn't mean he wasn't in the Old Testament. So this is like a spinoff of this is what I can study is looking back in the Old Testament around Abraham's time, looking for things about this guy so that I can kind of understand what in the world that verse means that he didn't have a mom or dad. He didn't have genealogy. He didn't have a beginning or an end resembling the son of God. He remains a priest forever. So I'm very curious to see what is the backstory of that guy and what does that mean? Okay. So then I'm going to go ahead to the side and I'm going to write down his name and write some things that we know about him. So let's start with this very long name. I want to make sure I spell right. So I'm going to write his name. And then I'm just going to doodle a little guy, do a stick figure. This is a one step up from a stick figure. So <laughs> so don't think you have to be a artist to do this because literally stick figures are my jam. Okay. So Melchizedek is a king that's, um, he's the king of Salem. He's also a priest. He met Abraham and he blessed him. So we know he's a good guy. Okay, then it says he is also known as the king of it says, King of Righteousness, King of Salem, and King of Peace. I've already written King of Salem. So I'm going to write King of Righteousness, King of Peace. Okay, I highlighted without genealogy to kind of cover this whole uh, mystery verse. Um, so I'm going to write No Genealogy with a question mark and then point to this section. And then that is kind of a reminder of, I don't understand this. That's something I want to dig into. And you might get into your Bible commentary. You might go back to Abraham and try to understand where he fit in that story. Um, you might um, look up the name Melchizedek in a concordance and find every instance that they talk about him. So this is just a whole nother tangent you can go on to further your Bible study. Okay, what else about this guy? I have some notes on the side so that I'm not wasting <laughs> time trying to figure this out because these are packed, packed um, passages. So it says, think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. And if you've ever heard about tithing at church, um, this is a lot of this verse right here is ref is what we reference a lot if people talk about giving a tenth of your wages abraham gave um, melchizedek a tenth of his plunder when he took over these um when he defeated the kings the other kings and so a lot of times we talk about the 10 percent tithe is based on this story so that's just a side note now the law requires the descendants of levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people so here's a side note. The 12 tribes of Israel, there was one tribe called the Levites, and they were descendants of Levi. And they were not allotted land. 
Um, if you're confused about this, this is why I offer all my Bible timelines, my cheat sheets for every book of the Bible to explain all these really complicated concepts. But if you are familiar uh, with the 12 tribes, one of the tribes were the Levites, and they were not allotted land because they were assigned to be priests, and they lived among the other tribes. Okay, so the Levites were by genealogy to become the priests. And so this is talking about um, verse 5. It says, Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who became priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites. So once again, it's talking about how that was the ritual that they did was collected 10% uh, from to, to give to the priests so that they could... Um, support themselves and the things that the church needed. Um, even though they are descended from Abraham, this man, we're talking about Melchizedek, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by the people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Okay, there was a lot to unpack there. But what it's saying is Levi, Abraham had Isaac. And you won't find this in the passage, but you can find this in my Bible timeline notes. But this will kind of help you make sense of what in the world that's talking about. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. And Jacob had the 12 sons and one of them was named Levi and so Abraham was around way before Levi was born so Levi was still in the body of his ancestor means he wasn't born yet born after Abraham okay and when I do genealogies whoops I like to symbolize it with rectangles that's kind of like my quick look of, oh, when I look at this visual, that that's people, that's a genealogy. So that's why I like to illustrate it like that. Okay, so let's not get too detailed into this or you might be overwhelmed, um, as I tend to be. <laughs> so let's um, do, let's see. Okay, yeah, we can skip down to here. So if per Jesus, like Melchizedek, this is the last section of this. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? Okay, so what this is telling me, Aaron is Moses' brother. And that you can find in the book of Exodus. He was the first high priest. So remember they're wandering in the desert and God tells them to, they're wandering 40 years in the desert. God tells them to build a tabernacle um, and then they have to offer sacrifices in it. And there was a priest in charge of that. That was Aaron. So Aaron is that genealogy of chosen priests and then it's saying Melchizedek was a priest but he wasn't in the order of Aaron so he wasn't included in that group the Levitical priesthood so that's another question I'm like oh I thought all the priests were Levitical they were Levites they were from Levi um so that's kind of another uh where did Melchizedek come from all right, so it's talking about Jesus is just like Melchizedek. He didn't follow the rules of becoming a priest. He's his own uh, priest because, uh, let's see, let, it's going to tell you about how great Melchizedek and Jesus are. <laughs> For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. No one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, 
but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. So usually you become a priest based on regulation. He's actually saying, the author is saying that Melchizedek, um, it was more of an honor that he was a priest. And I don't know if that just means he was given the 10th and honored like a priest. Uh, I'm not sure. But it says Jesus is the same. He is not based on his ancestry, but the power of an indestructible life. So I find that really, really interesting. Um, and then it says, for it's declared you're a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that has a little footnote as well. And if you look at the bottom, that is Psalm 110.4. The former regulation set aside, it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect. But a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Um, and so this is talking about old law, the former regulation, um, and better hope. This is old law. This is the new law or covenant. Same. I'm using the words interchangeably. So it's talking about the hope of a new law. Um, and the former regulation was the old law. Um, okay, here's another quote that I'm just gonna write it. Oh, whoops. This one is, oh yeah, B. It's the same. Psalm 110. Four. It must be the same because it's referencing the same one. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing office because Jesus lives forever. He has a permanent priesthood. He's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So uh, right here, um, verse 18, I want to note it when it says it was weak and useless, the former law, that doesn't mean because God made a mistake. It means because uh, we are sinful. So we messed up the law, not God messed up the law. That's why we had a new covenant. And the reason for the new covenant was because under the old law, we basically had to follow all the rules or we couldn't be with God. And uh, basically we couldn't live up to that because we're imperfect and sinful. And so that's why God sent Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice, to be our intercessor between um, us being with God he was the one who made that right. So that's why they're teaching that this is the perfect law where before it was the old law didn't work because we're sinful. So what I like to do is another little diagram is saying we couldn't be with God is what this is saying because we were imperfect, but Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So if we go through Jesus, then we are made perfect so that we can be with God is what this is teaching. Um, let's see, anything else I want to talk about? Oh, yeah. Jesus, who is holy, such... Um, verse 26, Jesus is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He's unlike the other high priests. He does not need to offer sacrifice. He does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. Um, he sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. So he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but in the oath which came after the law appointed the son. So the son's been made perfect forever. So here I'm going to just do a couple of... Um, a couple of things. It says, holy... Blameless. Can you see that? Yes. Holy, blameless, blameless, pure, set apart. He is exalted above the heavens. Okay, so those are just my little notes on that passage. Okay, one more thing I wanted to add was when I can add that. Well, I've got room here. Old priests 
would offer sacrifices. Oh, let me do that. They would have to repeat them over and over and over. And Jesus did one sacrifice that was perfect and it never needed to be done again. So this might be a visual to help you understand that, is that the old priests had to repeat sacrifices and it was never going to be good enough. Um, and Jesus only had to do it once because he was the perfect sacrifice. Okay, what time is it? I said I would do the next chapter that somebody requested. Okay, it's, I usually go, go 30 minutes, but I'll go a little bit longer so that we can knock out chapter eight. It won't be as in depth as chapter seven, so that's good. And it continues the same concept. So chapter eight is the high priest of a new covenant. Um, it says, now the main point of what we were saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. So it's talking about um, the tabernacle that we had on earth with the old priests. Even that was flawed. And Jesus sits on the perfect sanctuary, the perfect, the true tabernacle set up by God, not a person. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And it was so, it's, and so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. So it's just kind of comparing that we can't, we're, we're imperfect beings. All right, the second part of chapter 8 is up here. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, ministry Jesus had received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator to superior to the old one since the new covenant is established on better promises. So I'm going to just hi highlight this one to simplify this complex uh, concept. It's saying the new covenant is established on better promises. We have a better chance of being with God because Jesus came down because he's our intercessor. Um, for there's been nothing wrong with the first covenant. No place would have been sought for another, but God found fault with the people. So nothing wrong with a covenant. First covenant... nothing wrong with it but it was impossible for us and the second covenant provides hope and Jesus makes it possible so the first covenant, basically, when it comes down to it, was impossible because we are not perfect. The second is possible because of Jesus. All right, here's a huge section that is all from, it says, footnote C, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And I'm not going to use my highlighter. I'm just going to do this quick. So right here, this is a prophecy fulfilled from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a Old Testament prophet um, that had his own book. He was known as the weeping prophet because he was kind of a Debbie Downer. <laughs> so um, this is actually good news for Jeremiah. This was the hope that he was hoping that would come. And here it is. Um, it says about the new covenant that's coming. So uh, this chapter ends by saying, by calling this covenant new, he's made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. So it's not that God is saying, whoops, I messed up. He's saying we couldn't have the second covenant until we had the first covenant and we've fulfilled the prophecies. And so it, this is good news. <laughs> so I hope this wasn't too over your head um, and that I didn't go too fast. 
for you, but I will take some pictures of these note pages and add them to the group if you want to copy them down if you didn't get all of them. Um, thank you girls for submitting um, your suggestions. Keep submitting your suggestions and I'll try to knock out um, three or four chapters next week as well. I uh, hope you have a great um, weekend. And if you want some of these style, if you're enjoying these style notes, but this is overwhelming for you to try to figure them out, I, if you don't know about it already, I offer cheat sheets for every single book of the Bible. It took me four years to go through them all and create them. And they are in the shop, ready to rock and roll. You can literally get the one for Hebrews for $4 if you just want to start there. Um, you can get whatever book you're studying, or you can just get the entire Bible is bundled at a discounted price. So that's over in my shop, amycenter.com forward slash shop. And I always get questions about this Bible that I'm using. It's ginormous. It's not really one you'd want to take to church, but it's great for note taking. I love this Bible. Um, and I'll leave the link for that if you're interested in that as well. Let me know if you have any questions or comments and I will see you next week. Bye girls.